So I'm Windows Snyder, and I'm going to talk to you about threat modeling in minutes. One of the uh, one of the things that uh, I got lucky with in my career was that I joined a company really early on called AdStake that thought that they wanted to build a PKI practice, which turned out to be misguided because nobody wants to do that. They want to outsource that. And while I was going around to all these customers, talking to them about this awful service that nobody wanted, um, I got these questions like, "What? How can I know if my application secure? What can I do to make it stronger?" And uh, since I had been working as a software engineer for so long, working on these security critical systems, I actually had good answers for them because they were kind of struggling with this. And um, I developed a methodology that at the time was called application architecture assessment. And it was very popular with, with this set of customers. And I worked with some other folks and developed this into a methodology that became known as threat modeling. I went to Microsoft and brought threat modeling along with me and at Microsoft because they're really good at turning things into processes and methodologizing things. Uh, it became much more formalized and at the same time uh, worked on developing the SDL. There's a lot of people co contributed to the SDL and, uh, and threat modeling was, was, was my primary contribution. So the SDL is this even bigger process where you contribute uh, security elements all along every step of the development process. And threat modeling fits in, hopefully, in the design process, but after implementation, if that's what you've got, because you can, you can do it at any, any point along, along the road. Now, it's better if you're able to do it earlier, because making a change is potentially as simple as wiping off a piece of the whiteboard, rather than re-implementing something significant if you find out that your mitigations are insufficient to the threats that you're trying to build. So this is the hope, and uh, very few organizations end up implementing anything that looks like this because it's big and complicated and it's pretty hairy. Microsoft is, is really great at making complicated processes repeatable, documenting every single step so that m multiple people can take it and, 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 and do it over and over again, even if they are um, you know, working in different kinds of environments with different kinds of people. And it scales up to very, very complex pro projects. So what's not so great? Microsoft adds more and more features. It becomes really complicated. And I think for most of us, we know at this point that simpler is, is very often better. Um, so what's up happening is that threat modeling becomes really, really onerous. It becomes this, this process that is so enormous that it's hard to get started. And it doesn't apply to smaller environments. Uh, this image is uh, a, a Katamari ball. It's this game where you're moving around a sticky ball, and it's small. So at first, you can pick up small things, like maybe candy, and then slightly bigger things, like um, a cat or a, a telephone. And then it gets bigger and bigger, and you're picking up a dog and a bench and a horse and a telephone pole and a building, and then eventually like a cruise ship and a, um, a mountain. And, and, and you end up with this massive ball of, of uh, completely unrelated objects that are just all tacked together. And that was the way threat modeling was starting to feel to me. So I've got some books here for you guys. And uh, I'm a little concerned because I hear that you guys haven't been asking questions. And I'm concerned because I don't want to have to carry these back to San Francisco. So I would like you all to start thinking about questions right now, because I will give both of these books to somebody who asks an interesting question. Um, and the threshold might be low, because it sounds like nobody's asking questions. So here you go. The first is Threat Modeling, which is my book from 2004. Threat modeling has 288 pages, and for some reason, the publisher was really insistent that this book get to 300 pages. And I thought it should be about, I don't know, 150, 200. But apparently, you can't write this kind of book that size. It doesn't sell. I don't know. The publisher had their own ideas about what was appropriate. But honestly, I think it would have been a better book if it was about half as long. In 2014, Adam Shostak wrote this book. This book is 624 pages, and um, it's got like these these paper thin, like like tissue thin uh, pages, like a Bible. It's 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 very long. It's 624 pages, and uh, he says in the intro, "Who should read this book? Those who create or operate complex technology." Which means that this probably doesn't fit every environment. <coughs> so what about everybody else? If I were to write the book today, I would write a book that was probably a pamphlet. And I would make this as small and lightweight as possible, because 
I'm exhausted with threat modeling. I'm exhausted with process. I'm exhausted with how enormous and undoable all these security processes have become. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, but you don't have to overdo the, the work. Um, and if you do, it leads to folks feeling like the investment's not worth it. What am I getting out of this? You're taking time away from other things that we need to be doing. Um, there's a, there's a trade-off for everything that you're doing. So this is what I propose, and it's uh, lighter weight. And it's actually essentially still what I documented in here, um, but just drawn down to its ba like most basic elements. The first is draw the system. Now, in both of these books, we talk about data flow diagrams. And those are really useful, but they're a little bit complicated. Um, and you don't have to do this, because if you're a developer in any engineering environment, you walk in there, let's say you're, you're a new engineer, you're on day one, or maybe you're even just interviewing. Every en other engineer you're going to talk to in that environment has a drawing when they talk about the system. You know, they draw the client over here, and the server over here, and here's the data store, and over here we talk to this service, et cetera. And on the whiteboard, you get a picture of what the system looks like. And they might draw lines to represent, like, client makes the request, service calls out to this other service, the transaction system's over here, it sends back the whatever, and off we go. And every environment knows how to draw this. It doesn't necessarily make for a data flow diagram, but it's something that every environment already knows how to do. So draw the system. Any which way you like, it doesn't matter. Identify the entry points. So in, in, in this case with our, um, let's call it a, 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 a media, a streaming media server, <coughs> you've got a, a client that um, the user logs into the client, um, let's say it's through their web browser, they log in, and um, now they've got access to the server. There's an administrative interface, which um, s uh, an administrator uses to manage um, user configs or um, billing, who knows what. And uh, there's maybe a configuration file or a configuration that's stored in a data store somewhere. And then, of course, there's data from the data store, and then maybe there's a service that's interacting with it, like a financial transaction, letting you know whether or not the user's paid up for the month. Um, and all those things are entry points into the system. And then, let's say, the configuration for the underlying OS or platform that it's running on. OK, we're done with that step. Walk through the system. OK, user logs in. They uh, select their, their music. It plays. Fine. Administrator logs in, uh, changes a password for a user, does this set of administrative tasks. OK. Uh, configuration is, exists on the file, on the, on the, uh, in the data store, gets loaded up on boot. OK. And um, financial transaction system is uh, requested by this service, and it uh, performs its transaction, sends back its response, and, and that's that. So just walk through it. Like you're, you're walking through a building, you, walk through all, you, enter, you go through all the entry points in the system, and you see how the, the different components get called. Identify targets. We've got a server sitting on um, a lot of bandwidth, because this is a streaming media server. So um, that's uh, something that maybe would be interesting, that there are plenty of folks out there that take over systems so that they can host um, malware or um, illegal content, what have you, that's useful for, for some folks. We've got a uh, financial transaction system that we are um, a, a channel for. That might be an interesting target. There's you know, credit card information. We've got a, a store of credentials because the users have to log in, and those uh, credentials are, are a target. And then we've got the, the user themselves because we're presenting them with um, a interface that they trust that hosts something that they might, let's say, if you tell them to download something, they might from that interface. So, so that interface is a, so that, that, that client machine is also a target. Identify threats. Well, somebody might host, if they take over our server, they might use it to host uh, malicious software because they are interested in, taking it, in, in using all of our traffic to take over workstations of our clients that are likely to be highly monetizable because we already know that these are users that use their credit card online to pay for this service. So if I am able to take over those workstations, they're probably going to have data on them that I can monetize. I can turn them into a botnet. I can, um, if I if I take over the uh, the channels of the financial transaction system, I might be able to capture uh, um, financial information. 
if I take over the server, I can host my malware server on it. I can host um, uh, content that I'm, I'm, I'm illegally broadcasting for, for, for revenue. Those are the kinds of things that uh, I might want to do with this system. Now, mitigations against those threats, okay, well, we've got the financial transaction system is operating on a different process. So there's a very narrow channel between the service and that process. And so you've got uh, a really small attack surface to go from here to there on the financial end. On the, the client end, well, maybe we haven't mitigated that one sufficiently because if we are compromised, how will we even know that the code has changed? Maybe what we need here is a mitigation to uh, identify whether or not the code that we're hosting has changed. Um, on the back end, uh, for, the, for, the, for the data store, okay, those passwords are hashed, they're salted. Um, are we doing something reasonable here? Okay, let's host that someplace separate. So we've compartmentalized these all into uh, different spaces, and now they are uh, only reachable through the very narrow channels that are uh, enabled for the functions that the system needs. So now let's use the threat model. We've identified uh, places maybe where we're doing a lot of processing, where we are um, uh, storing sensitive information. We use these to make decisions about what to do next. So threat modeling is just one step in, in, in the overall process. The next step might be implementation level analysis. What requires source code review? What requires penetration testing or um, fuzzing if, um, at the protocol level or for a, a file format? This is the roadmap to everything else that you're going to do to try and secure this system. And instead of thrashing around and wasting our time in places that uh, either aren't reachable by the code or are uh, low interest or low value to an attacker, let's go for the juicy stuff, let's go for the sensitive stuff, let's go for the fragile stuff. Now we add a new feature. We want to make sure we update the threat model. In this model, we've got a, uh, a new feature now. We've allowed clients to share playlists. And now we have to worry about uh, cross-site scripting because users are able to insert code into the uh, system that will be viewed by, uh, that could potentially be viewed by other users. Um, update the threat model to to reflect this new feature and its new Im and its impact on the system. So fine, one size does not fit all. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't have these massively complex methodologies. Um, and some of these might be appropriate. Some of these steps might be appropriate for a small environment and not appropriate for a large environment. And so, for a large environment, you might have to do a lot more work or break it down into components so you can tackle each component as a, uh, a manageable size. A complex system is, it's the kind of thing you, you know it when you see it. Um, it might have 100 plus devs. It might have folks working on it for, for 10 plus years. It might have hundreds of, uh, hundreds of repositories or tens of repositories, millions of lines of code. It might be written in multiple languages, or it might be the kind of uh, applications that's deployed in high security um, requirement environment. And it might be any or none of these things, but if you're working on a complex project, you'll recognize it. So an example of a really complex project is web browser. Um, it's, it, it may or may not be large, although most of them are pretty large projects. Um, but more importantly, it executes arbitrary code from the internet. This is like core functionality, and that is fraught with peril. Uh, it does tons of parsing of every like file format. And in addition to being a web browser, it's a video player, an audio player. It's, it's, it's a bunch of different clients in one, and each one of those things is dangerous. Um, PDF readers. And, and image viewers are, are, are some of the, the most juicy targets that we've seen. Additionally, they're deployed, deployed in every environment. You don't know if this browser is going to be used in a bank, or if it's going to be used by a government um, office, if it's going to be used at a school or for home users. You just have to expect it to be deployed everywhere and anywhere, and that all your users are going to have completely different requirements. Additionally, uh, for having worked on almost every browser out there, I have to say that in every environment, the user experience and this fear of breaking the internet took priority and precedence over every security concern. You can't break the internet. If you break the internet, then people won't use this. If that flash site doesn't work, then people will go use another browser. If this um, doesn't render, then they're going to stop using this. If, it's, if it slows down even a fraction of, 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 a, of a percent, then they'll choose a different browser. So all these things are, are more important than then making sure that we've we've got a uh, secure system. Somewhat simpler is a uh, you know maybe a hundred uh, less than a hundred devs with uh, 
uh, you know, a couple languages, but it's probably a single component of a larger system. And if this is what you're working on, um, you might have an approach that looks more like uh, once a quarter, you check in and see if your threat model is up to date, and initially maybe you spend a couple of hours with it because you can get pretty far you know, with only a small investment. So for a simpler system, maybe a couple of hours, where for a larger, a more complex system, maybe you're spending a couple hours every quarter, even just to update it, where the first go might have taken a day. It, but it really depends on, on your own environment and how, um, and how deep you want to go. I got to tell you that the most valuable work in a threat modeling session comes out pretty early on. By um, the end of it, you're getting to this point where you're thinking really hard, and every once in a while you come up with something to stick on the whiteboard, and eventually you realize that you're getting uh, low return for the amount of time that you're spending, and it's time to t taper off. So that's probably a point where you've, you've hit diminishing returns, and it's time to say, you know what, I think we'll wrap this up, revisit it in a quarter, and, and move on. So in this example, we've got a log server, or any kind of server that does essentially this, and this is like every server, receives data from here, performs some sort of transformation, and sends data over there. Um, a, a log server might be receiving data from lots of over there's and doing lots of transformations on it. It might be really sensitive to denial of service, or it might be sensitive to accuracy. So you want to make sure that you get everything ordered properly, um, and you have all kinds of uh, attacks that might um, interfere with integrity by delaying messages, et cetera. You've got things that you need to be concerned with because people don't need to trust the integrity of their log server. Um, and then you need to make sure that when you send the data over there, it actually arrives over there. Um, and uh, this might be a component of a larger system. It might be just the logging component of a, of a larger system. But this is the sort of project that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, like you probably can get it done in about an hour and, um, and then just revisit it. Revisiting it, I think, is more important than, than capturing everything on the first go. And we've got some tiny systems that, like, maybe a mobile app. And uh, maybe we've only been working on it for a short, short period of time, um, and there's only a couple of folks working on it. So this is the sort of system that Mabry doesn't implement very much its, itself. It's leveraging everything from uh, underlying APIs, from the platform or from, from the OS. Uh, so everything is, is, is abstracted away from the developer, from crypto to storage to uh, communication to um, uh, uh, even in a higher level language, memory management is abstracted away from the developer, and now you're, you don't have to worry about um, memory corruption issues, which is fantastic. And this project is tiny. You know it's tiny if everyone on the system understands the whole project completely, um, because projects have a, have a tendency to get large, larger the, uh, as, as time goes by, and you get to the point where it's not realistic for everybody to understand absolutely everything in the project. So this is the sort of thing where you just get that set of folks together, bang it out, and then revisit it. But maybe only when you do a major up upgrade. That might be once a year. The whole reason we go through this exercise is so that we end up sp spending our time properly. Because everything you do as a security practitioner is a trade-off for the business. That we're making this investment in security, um, and it's it's worthwhile. We demonstrate some sort of return for, for having spent that time that way. Because it's a trade-off for the business that's time and energy and engineering that we could have spent developing new features or maybe resources that would have been uh, deployed in sales or, or in other ways. So making sure that the work that we do has a direct uh, payoff for the business is actually really hard. And I don't think we spend enough time uh, examining that. Because as an industry, we are aware of all the possibilities. But not all of the possibilities are required for every organization or for every implementation. And so making that analysis is part of doing threat modeling. Um, we need to make sure that our spend is, is appropriate for the environment, for the company, for the market. And that's the whole point of threat modeling, to help us invest wisely in security. Because overall, the most important thing is that practical security actually gets deployed. Um, instead of knowing what to do but not getting it done because we've decided we can't, that, that, uh, that the, the perfect implementation is, is unattainable. Um, this is about getting something done and getting it out there. Thank you. <laughs> so I've got two books here. If anyone has questions, I will give you both of them to the, interest, the most interesting question. So we you have a question over there. Woo! You can figure out for your environment which of these One is more appropriate suite. for your environment. One brave suite out of like 250 or something. That's <laughs> good. That's good. So let's, uh, does the question have to qualify? 
What can it be? If like? it's the only one, I'll take it. Oh, <laughs> okay, Sounds like supply and demand. The old laws of yeah. I don't want to carry it home. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. What's your opinion about using the stride threat categories when doing threat modeling? Um, I think um, I think it's a great tool for folks who are not familiar with uh, with security. If it's not obvious uh, for your environment, what they um, how the threats shake out, and maybe it's because this is your first go at it, or um, you guys haven't thought about the specific threats that your your system reveals, or you haven't seen other systems threat modeled, so it's not um, these things aren't jumping out at you. Then it's a it's a, a good tool to get your brain going and and start thinking about these things. But I feel like it's uh, it's incomplete. I don't feel like it addresses everything. Um, so I don't rely on it uh, too significantly. I feel like it misses. Um, uh, uh, quite a lot of things, but it's uh, I think a good a good starting place. I think that's actually a, <laughs> a good question. I get that one um, from a lot of folks, and even though I haven't been talking about threat modeling for probably a decade at this point, um, I still get that one today. So that's that's a good one. Great. Come pick your books <coughs> if you dare. Come pick your books. Oh, oh, we got another taker over here. Yeah, are you going to give him both or just one? <laughs> I'm going to give him both because I already already. <laughs> yeah. There you go. They're consistent. I like that too. There. So one more question. Could who someone give her mic, maybe? Yeah, great, thank you. It's or him, yeah. sorry. Who, who is the uh, normal founder of your job? Oh, uh, I'm the CSO of Fastly. And at Fastly, I uh, run an operations team, a, an application security team, a security research team, the team that builds the WAF, which is one of our products. Um, so that's who, who funds me, but uh, when uh, Emmy reached out, I was like trying to gesture to Emmy. When Emmy reached out to me, she said that she would really like to hear a talk on threat modeling. And um, I've been staying away from threat modeling because as I said, I feel like it's gotten to this point where it's it's this big ball of undoable. And um, so I've, I've kind of just been exhausted with it. Uh, but you know, I think it's it's probably worth revisiting. So I can say things like, you know, don't get frustrated, just jump in, do, do whatever's appropriate for your environment and like, you know, do it at the level that makes sense. Don't get bogged down. You know that's that's completely um, what we're trying to avoid. Great. Thank you so much, Window. Thank you. Thank you.